Go with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. As you turn there, I found a, a really good illustration of what we're talking about today. There's a small mammal that lives in the tundra forest called the ermine. And it was prized by hunters for its soft, pure, white coat. But in those snowy climates, this animal's ability to hunt and survive is dependent on that coat. It cannot be stained. Because any spot or impurity, and it would be very easy to see, and it would lose its ability to hunt. So rather than chase this extremely fast and agile animal, it's only about two pounds, it's very small, hunters devised a different strategy. They would find the burrow where the ermine lived, and they would cover the outside in mud or tar. Then they would let their dogs loose, who would begin to chase the ermine, and the ermine would run back to its burrow, see that the outside was covered in tar and mud, and then this little two-pound animal would turn and prepare to fight these 70-pound hunting dogs because it knew the purity of its coat was worth more than life itself. We can learn a good lesson from this little creature. It valued its purity above its own life. How much do we value our purity? How much do we value holiness? So far in the book of Acts, we've seen the Spirit fill and empower the church and grow it. We've seen the Spirit embolden new believers to proclaim the gospel. We've seen the Spirit encourage them to withstand persecution from outside and from their government. But now, at the end of chapter 4 and beginning of chapter 5, the church is facing a new danger. They're facing the danger of impurity from within. It's a danger that I, I fear, unlike the early church, unlike the ermine, we are unworried about impurity. We don't take it seriously, certainly not as seriously as we are called to. So let's pray and ask God to show us the importance of our purity this morning. Father, we thank you that you are a holy God. We've seen your holiness in Leviticus. We've seen it in our songs. We're going to see it here in Acts. And we pray, God, that we would value your holiness that it would not simply be just one of your attributes that we are unconcerned about, that it would be our only hope and stay. And God, you've given that same holiness to us, and yet we are often unworried about it. We are unconcerned. God, I pray, help us see that our purity is worth more than life itself. Let us value holiness. Let us see that from your word, that we may be more and more conformed to your Son's holy image today. It's in His name we pray. Amen. We'll begin today by reading the whole of our narrative, Acts 4.32 through 5.11. That way we can have the whole in mind as we study the details. So this is what the Word of God says, beginning in Acts 4.32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to Him was His own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But, in contrast, a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. 
And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. Are you shocked? Does that seem like an overreaction on the Spirit's part? Friends, we need to examine the importance of purity that we see in this passage. First and foremost, we see, and Luke gives us a good example, that if we are rightly living with Christ, if we are rightly filled with the Spirit, we will be filled with a purity that must be practiced. And first and foremost, that practice will drive us to pursue pure peace with one another. We'll look at the good example, and then we'll get to the bad example in a moment. But in the good example, the church is filled with a pure peace. Look at verse 32. The full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. No one said that any of the things that belonged to him were his own. They had everything in common. Luke speaks of the unity of the full number of those who believed. This this tells us the church had a membership that was known. A requirement of that membership was belief in the gospel. And in fact, it was that belief that formed the foundation of their peace. They were of one heart. In other words, they were united in what they loved and what they cared about and what they were passionate about, what they most valued, because they believed the gospel together. And they were united as one soul their whole lives, from the deepest part of them to the things they thought about to who they were. It was all dedicated to the same thing, their belief in the gospel. And this unity extended beyond their inward selves to their outward selves to their possessions. They didn't see any of their possessions as their own. Everything was in common. What they had was not for their consumption, but was for the use of the community. What is it that most often disturbs our peace with others? It's what we love. It's who we see ourselves as, our identity, and what we own. Yet in these three areas, the church was striving intentionally to be filled with grace and love for one another because of what they believed. But how? Well, Luke tells us because they were continually submitting themselves to pure preaching. Verse 33, with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. With great power. And in Acts, we probably think, oh, that means there was lots of miracles. But that's not what Luke's talking about. He's talking about the power of the testimony of the resurrection of Christ. They spoke of Jesus of Nazareth and His humanity. They spoke of His obedience to the law that He had authored. They spoke of His divinity as Lord and Son of God. And they spoke of His atoning death on their behalf. He spoke of their sins as forgiven. He spoke of His glorious resurrection and ascension to the right hand of the Father. They spoke with great power because they spoke the gospel. And those who heard and submitted to this testimony were clearly changed. They were no longer devoted to pursuing their own heart's desires because now they were pursuing the gospel. They were no longer focused on their old soul's identity because now they identified as believers in the gospel. They no longer saw their possessions as something to fight about because Jesus was coming back. As the gospel told them, there was no reason to worry about possessions. There was a better kingdom coming. They sat under pure preaching, and it led to pure peace. But it also, we see, led to pure pardon. They were covered in grace. Great grace was upon them all. Certainly, I think this speaks to the way that the, through the gospel, God had given grace to the church. But I think it also speaks, I think it also speaks to the way that they had grace on one another. <laughs> I imagine that they were gracious and forgiving towards one another. They were gracious and kind towards one another. They put one another first. They were gracious and thankful for the blessing and benefit that they gained by being with one another. Now, we, we can't imagine that the church was without sin, and I think this is really important. Sometimes we look at these acts and we think, man, this church was perfect. I wish I could have gone there. 
Me too, right? But the church was still full of sin. That's why they needed to have great grace. They were full of sinners, ready to pardon one another, ready to be gracious to one another, ready to be kind and forgiving to one another. This is especially important in what we're about to see when people sin. They could have confessed at any time and been forgiven. For great grace was upon them all. And this great grace was not merely theological, it was practical, for it led to pure provision. Excuse me. Look at verses 34 to 37. Luke says that there was not a needy person among them. This doesn't mean all Jerusalem. The church was not responsible for all the poor in all the city. They were responsible for those who were in need among them, those who were members of the church. And how was this accomplished? Well, it was accomplished by those who had, sharing with those who didn't have. Luke says that as many as were owners of lands, plural, or houses, plural, sold them. Luke is speaking of those who owned multiple houses, those who owned much land, sold the extra, and provided for those who did not have. doesn't mean that everyone in the church just became homeless immediately. It's not how it worked. Those who have been blessed by God with wealth shared the wealth with those who did not. It doesn't mean that those who didn't have got to live selfishly, though. If you look back to verse 32, everyone in the church saw their possessions as for the benefit of the community. I've known people, they say, my house isn't very nice, so I don't have people over. Well, that's not what verse 32 tells us. It says, whatever you have, you see it as the benefit of the community. The whole church was full of gracious giving. It's important to note that this giving was voluntary. It's implied in these verses, but it's made explicit by Peter in chapter 5. In his confrontation with Ananias, he says, look, the land was yours. You could do with, with it what you wanted. And even what you sold, the money was yours. You didn't have to give any of it. People have used these verses to try and paint the picture as communistic. It's not what's going on here. This was all voluntary. It was a voluntary sacrifice because of the love they had for one another. And it's really important that we see, notice in verse 35, they laid it at the apostles' feet. We talked about in Thessalonians, in this culture, there was the idea of clients and patrons. So the rich patrons, or clients, I always get this mixed up, but the rich ones would give out money to the poor so that the poor would give them compliments or run errands for them or do little side jobs. And the goal as a rich person was to collect as many people to you, as many clients as possible, so that you would be seen as rich and fancy and powerful. But that's not what the rich in the church did. They didn't go around gathering clients. They gave the money, and they laid it at the apostles' feet so that those who were honored were the church, not themselves. It was still public, but it was a very humble act of giving. It was that the church may be lifted up. And Luke gives us uh, one example of this pure giving by showing us a story of Barnabas slash Joseph. He was so encouraging, the apostles just renamed him, son of encouragement. He was a Levite, born in the island of Cyprus, Clearly, he was well off. He sold a field, and he laid the money at the apostles' feet. He encouraged the whole church by his example of faithfulness and grace and love. And so we need to ask ourselves, do we love our church like this? Is our purity practiced like this? Now, as far as I know, none of our church members are currently in financial need. Uh, But please hear me. If you are, please tell us so that we can help you. We want to be a church like this. So if if one of our members is in need and isn't telling us, we don't get the opportunity to live out, to be covered in this kind of grace. So please tell us. But with that said, we have to ask whether we love enough, one another enough, enough to give sacrificially, to live like this. We did a survey last month, and I'll share one interesting point of data. I found this very interesting. We got like, I think, 25 responses. I personally think I speak of financial giving very rarely. Uh, but on the survey, only three people marked that I don't talk about it enough. And the thing that those three people, have, three people had in common is that they don't get a paycheck. So everyone who gets a paycheck thinks I talk about giving plenty. <laughs> but those who don't think maybe I should talk about it more. And I'm not trying to pull too much out of that, but I think it's something we should consider. Do we legitimately plan to and think about giving? Would we be willing to not just sacrifice what's extra, but sacrifice the things we love for those in need? And so I was ready to write out a whole application about the importance of giving financially and supporting the ministry of church. I had a bunch of stuff written, but then I came across this quote, and I was really convicted by it. 
David Peterson said this, the remarkable, remarkable point about this passage is the implication that it was the powerful preaching of the gospel that motivated the earliest Christians to such generosity, not specifically preaching about money or impassioned exhortations from leaders to share possessions. The gospel message about God's grace in Christ inspired a culture of self-giving and love. Giving is ultimately a gospel issue. John tells us this in his first letter. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods, sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? John and our passage in Acts, they, they teach us that if we're not actively giving, it's not a giving problem, it's a gospel problem. If we're not sacrificing our money and giving it to our church to support the ministry, how can we say that God's grace is truly upon us? If we don't see our possessions as God's gifts to bless the church, how can we say we look forward to the resurrection of Christ? If we're not sacrificing our time to disciple one another, how can we say that we have truly believed in the gospel at all? I pray that each of us would examine our hearts, consider our giving, not because giving is ultimate, because our giving is directly linked to our love for Christ and the gospel and the hope and the resurrection. How faithfully and sacrificially we give is linked directly to how much we are filled with love from the Father. But I want to make another application from this point. Perhaps you're here today and you've always assumed you were a Christian. But as you look at your life, you do not see this kind of sacrificial love filling your life. You, you can't imagine giving up something, much less selling something important to you to care for others. That just sounds foreign to you. Perhaps you are realizing that you may not be a Christian. God's love may not abide in you. If that's you, <coughs> I don't want you to worry about giving. That's not important for you today. <laughs> because we're only called to give once we've accepted what God has given to us. Christ laid down his life for you so that God's love may abide on you. All that he requires of you is to repent of your selfishness and sin and believe on the salvation available in Christ. So would you lay down your pride today and believe the gospel? Be ready to give all. If so, talk with me or someone else after the service. We, we can all together grow in practicing our purity. But sadly, no church is perfect. And even that early church was not perfect. We see in verses 1 and 2, the church's purity must be protected. Let's read verses 1 and 2 together. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Again, Peter makes it clear it was his stuff. He didn't have to give it. So what was wrong with this? Well, they saw the praise that men like Barnabas received, and they wanted that. They wanted the credit. But they didn't actually want to sell their stuff, because they liked their stuff, and they liked money. So Ananias concocts a plan to get both. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to sell the property for X amount, but then he's going to donate a, section, a portion of it to the church and claim it's the whole thing. That way he still gets to keep most of his money, and he gets the praise for being so generous. Luke uses the word kept back, and this word refers to the idea of skimming off the top, dishonest bookkeeping. In a sense, it's the sin of embezzlement. So clearly his goal was to deceive. It's not super clear in the English, but that's certainly what his goal was. And they decided to do this together. He sold it with his wife. It was with her knowledge he kept it back. So these two together made this plan. They have allowed impurity and greed to fill their hearts. And we see in the response of the Holy Spirit that the church's purity must be protected. And we see against four specific dangers in the text today. Number one, the church's purity must be protected against Satan. Peter says in verse 3 of chapter 5, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? Over and over again, we've read in this book that the saints were filled with the Holy Spirit. And yet here, Ananias is filled by Satan. And I, I do think Peter is referring to Satan himself, specifically and directly. Satan is a real being. And Peter knew that. Jesus had spoken to him of Satan in Luke 22, where he said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you. 
that they might sift you like wheat. I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. And what happened? Peter denied three times that he knew him. Peter had experience with Satan himself. Peter knew what his work was like. Now, we must remember, I think these verses teach us, Satan is not all-powerful. God is all-powerful. Satan is not his equal. Satan had to demand access to Peter. And Satan is not limited, or he is limited, sorry, he is limited, unlike God. And so he can only attack so many people at once. God rules over all the universe without effort. Satan has to put in effort to attack something specific. He demanded the opportunity to attack Peter, and now Satan is targeting this couple. I, I think his plan is, okay, I tried outside persecution, and that didn't work. I'll try polluting it from the inside. He wants to destroy the early church before it gets going. I think in Western culture, we don't tend to think of spiritual warfare very often. We tend to think of the church in very earthly ways. It's a group of people with a message talking to people who don't believe that message. That's true. There's a lot more to it than that, and we tend to forget about that, and we don't think about it. The Bible makes it clear that there is a real spiritual war going on all around us at every moment. We just don't notice it. Paul said this in Ephesians 6, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We must be careful that we are not so foolish as to ignore the spiritual battles taking place around us. But we also have to be careful not to be so foolish as to fear the spiritual powers all around us. Because <coughs> notice, Peter does not address Satan specifically. He doesn't try and do an exorcism. He doesn't do any chanting or get weird crystals or any of this other stuff that we see modern New Ages in doing. He just confronts Ananias with truth. He says, Ananias, why is it? Notice verse 4. Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? So Satan attacked Ananias. But Ananias didn't have to give in. Even to Satan, Ananias didn't have to give in. He chose to do this. This is really important for us as Christians because we, we can't forget that Satan's out there. He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We have to be mindful of that. But we can't fear him because even Ananias could have said no. Peter could have said no. We can say no. You can say no to Satan. Not because you're great. Because the Spirit lives within you. We are foolish to ignore spiritual powers, but we are just as foolish to fear them. Even Satan, as powerful as he is, is not as powerful as the one living inside of us. Think about it. When do, you, when do you lock your doors? Before the thief comes in or after he's already inside? It'd be better to lock before the thief arrives. If we know Satan is out there seeking whom he may devour, let's lock our doors ahead of time. Let's pray before the temptation comes. That's why Jesus taught us to pray. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's foolish to wait until the battle against lust or laziness or greed has already begun to start praying. Don't get me wrong. You should also pray then, right? Pray in the midst of temptation, but don't wait until you're tempted to pray. Jesus teaches us to pray ahead of time. Consider how much easier, how much ho more holy our life would be if we took seriously the threat of Satan and his forces, and we spend time in prayer each day asking that God would deliver us not only from evil, but keep us from temptation in the first place, because we know we're not going to succeed every time. What if Ananias and Sapphira had prayed that Satan, or prayed to God that they would avoid temptation that day before they concocted this plan? What if we prayed this way before we went into the office or went to school, knowing we're going to face temptation after temptation? What if we pray this way before we returned home after a long day where we're going to face temptation after temptation? <coughs> Must protect our purity against Satan and his forces through prayer. But our sin is not most centrally about Satan. It is most centrally about God himself. 
And so we see that we must protect our purity against lying to the Spirit. Because we can pollute the community through our sin. Look at what Peter says. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? By keeping back some of the proceeds, he was attempting to defraud the Holy Spirit who lived inside of him and saw him planning all this and doing all of this. Not a great plan. By misusing the property and funds, he was attempting to deceive the Holy Spirit. Ananias was not only contriving this dean's heart to lie to the church, he was lying to the Spirit himself. And in this passage, we get some really important statements about the Spirit and who he is. Because you can't lie to a feeling. You can't lie to a force. You can't lie to some aspect of God. You can only lie to a person, to a being. The Holy Spirit is not a force that exists between God and the Son. The Holy Spirit is a co-equal member, person, being of the Trinity, just as the Father and the Son are. Because in verse 4, Peter says that he had lied to God. Peter's not changing his mind halfway through his confrontation. He said, hey, you lied to the Spirit, you lied to God, same person. Which means when we sin against the church, we are sinning directly against God. This is what Jesus says to Saul. We'll get there in Acts 9. Paul falls on the ground, he hears a voice that said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my church? No, Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? God identifies himself with his church. And more than that, these passages teach us that the way we relate to God is the way we relate to the church. It cannot be separated. How many times have you heard someone say, oh, you know, I love God, but I don't love his church? According to these verses, that person doesn't love either one. How you treat the church is how you treat God. We cannot have a right relationship with God if we are holding ourselves back from the church. So when we selfishly keep back our offerings that would support the church, we are withholding from God himself. When we stubbornly refuse to confess our sin and seek help in our struggles to the church, we are pushing away God himself. When we sinfully choose to spend our time and energy on activities with friends or family, rather than being devoted to God's church, we are showing we are not devoted to God himself. There is no middle ground here. God cannot be separated from his church. How we treat one is how we treat the other, no matter what we may claim. As John wrote in 1 John 1, that which we've seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Would you have fellowship with the Father? Would you be in fellowship with the Son? Would you want life in the Spirit? Then be in fellowship with His church. We cannot claim we desire closeness with God if we are not pursuing closeness with the church. We cannot claim we are committed to God if we are not committed to His church. We cannot claim we love God if we do not love His church. To make these claims would be to lie to the Holy Spirit. I pray that none of us would be guilty of lying to the Spirit today. So consider, what do we say about God? What do we say about our relationship with God? And is that true about His church? If it's not, We may need to confess that we have lied to the Spirit. This is a serious thing. We're going to talk about the seriousness of it in a moment. But why is it so serious? Why does God take this kind of lying so seriously? Because when they lie to the Spirit, they are testing the Spirit. Or we could say, in other words, they're slandering the Spirit and God's character. Look at verses 7 through 9. Peter, speaking to Sapphira, after an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. I imagine him saying that with tears in his eyes, just begging, hoping that she will repent. But what does she say? Yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you've agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Though, just like Ananias, she's given multiple opportunities to confess and repent. She sticks to her schemes and her lies. But Peter asks her, how is it you've agreed to test the Spirit of the Lord? To, to test someone in authority is to intentionally, purposely break the rules to see and test whether discipline will actually come. 
So as parents, we've probably seen this. Our kids do this a lot as they grow up. You tell them, hey, don't climb the stairs. So what do they do? They walk towards the stairs. You say, don't climb the stairs. And then they smile a little bit and they put their one hand on the stairs. You say, son, don't test me. I will discipline you. Do not climb the stairs. And what do they do? They try and sprint up the stairs and they fall down because they're babies. And that's why you told them not to climb the stairs in the first place. Friends, this is what we do when we test the Lord. This is what Ananias and Sapphira were doing. Perhaps they were testing God's knowledge, thinking they could get away with it and God wouldn't even know. Perhaps they were testing His grace, thinking the Spirit would be too gracious. He would never discipline them. Perhaps they were testing God's justice, thinking they would get maybe a little slap on the wrist. It's not a big deal to sin. But no matter the specific thought process they had, they were slandering and testing God's holiness. They were ultimately saying God was not holy because they didn't believe they needed to be holy in His presence. And it is here we're reminded of that Old Testament narrative that John read for us this morning in Leviticus 9 and 10. Nadab and Abihu enter the tabernacle for the first time. They were the sons of Aaron, the high priest, and almost immediately after God establishes the tabernacle as His place of holy worship, you read all the sacrifices they had to, they had to do just to get access to the tabernacle. They slandered God's holiness. They brought in unauthorized fire, fire from outside the tabernacle, maybe from their own tent, thinking, you know what, just what I have on hand is fine. It's not a big deal. It doesn't have to be separate. Common, everyday worship is fine. Partial obedience is good enough. God's not really that holy. This was slander against God's holiness, and God explains why this is such a problem in Leviticus 10.3. He says, among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all the people, I will be glorified. If those who come near to worship will not sanctify or honor or treat God as holy, then all the people will be taught by example that God is not holy. This this truth shows us that our personal holiness is not personal, at least not alone. When we test the Lord, we are declaring before the world that God is not holy, and we tell them He is unworthy of glory. When we come near the Lord and we praise His love, but we are living in bitterness and anger towards our spouse, we're saying that His love is not holy, it's not worthwhile, we don't need to strive for it. When we come near the Lord and praise His sovereignty and wisdom, but we live in chaos and stress and anxiety, we are declaring before the world Look, God's not really in control. His holiness doesn't matter. I can walk in front of Him with sin. When we come near the Lord and praise His sufficiency, but we're living in sorrow and loneliness because we're single and we don't have that family, we are testing the Lord and declaring He's not enough and He's not glorious. When we do not sanctify the Lord, we are teaching the people around us that God is not glorious. We are slandering His Spirit and God cares about His holiness. He will be sanctified. He will be glorified. God will not sue us for slander. He will bring judgment. And so we see our final point this morning. Our purity must be protected against spiritual death. We'll read verses 5 and 6 and then 9 and 10, verses 5 and 6. When Ananias heard these words, the words Peter confronted him with, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard it. The young men rose, wrapped him up, and carried him out and buried him. Verse 9. <clears throat> Peter says, Behold, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door. They will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. The young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. When we read this story, we may think, man, that got out of hand. That escalated quickly. God overreacted. Yeah, it was a slimy thing to do, but it wasn't a big deal. Friends, if that's our response, it shows we don't understand the holiness of God. I need to be clear. I I think the text shows us that Ananias and Sapphira were truly saved. They were believers. Most likely, they'd been walking faithfully with the Lord for at least a few months. But we all know even believers can leave their first love and be caught up in sin. 
Because notice Peter keeps giving Ananias and Sapphira opportunities to repent. He says, why did you do this? Don't you realize you didn't have to do this? How could you do this? Only after multiple opportunities to repent are they disciplined. I think it's really important that we say that they're believers because otherwise it's a really easy out to say, oh, they weren't real believers. And I'm a real believer, so I don't have to worry about this. But friends, that's not the testimony of Scripture. The Bible's teaching is that God cares so much about His glory, He will take the life of His people. Look at 1 Corinthians 11. Paul said, For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Some in Corinth had died because they tested the Lord in His supper. They had selfishly consumed. They had not cared for the church body. They had not loved those around them. They had not sanctified Him. They had not taught others to glorify Him, and so God took their life. What this means is that those of us here today who are testing the Lord by the way we live, whether we are living in unrepentant sexual sin, addiction, bitterness, laziness, jealousy, strife, anger, envy, theft, greed, any other unrepentant sin, we are eating and drinking judgment on ourselves, and God may take our earthly life away. Why would God do that? Isn't He a God of grace and mercy and love? Doesn't He love us? Yes, He loves us, but He loves His glory more. Among those who are near, He will be sanctified. And among those, among all people, He will be glorified. God's glory is a deathly, serious issue. And we have to take it that way. That's why James 5 calls us to pursue those who have wandered from the faith, who have wandered from obedience. James says, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul, or we could say life from death, and will cover a multitude of sins. Those who wander from the truth are testing the Lord and His truth. They are not sanctifying, they are not glorifying Him, and their soul or their life may die If we truly love those around us in the church, we will pursue those who wander from the truth. This is what Peter was doing when he was asking all those questions. He could have just kicked them out. He could have said, get out. I don't want to see you anymore. He pursues them. He's begging them to repent. We do this because we care about their soul and their life. We want their sins to be covered. We want them to be reunited with the church. We want them to live. But most importantly, we want God to be sanctified and glorified. If we care about His glory, we will confront sin. Yet sadly, there are times when regardless of our pursuit, they refuse to repent. They refuse to be brought back. And in those sad situations, God has not told us, wait for the Spirit to take their life. He's told us to practice church discipline. Again, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my Spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus... You are to deliver this man who was unrepentant, living in sexual sin. Deliver this man to to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. We are called to deliver unrepentant church members to the destruction of the flesh. We don't take their life. I'm thankful that that's not the application of Acts 5. And we don't wait for the Holy Spirit to do it. The rest of the New Testament tells us that is an example of what church discipline looks like, but we're called to remove them from membership, not because we're angry, not because we hate them, certainly not because we think we're better than them, but because God will be sanctified by those close to Him. And if someone is unwilling to sanctify the Lord, they must be removed so that He will be glorified by all the people. Church discipline is not a death sentence, but it's a very, very dangerous thing. It delivers people to Satan. Not a great thing. It's not a good situation. The Spirit took Ananias and Sapphira's life for three reasons. The first was that God may be glorified in His church. The second was for the benefit of their own souls, because it kept them from greater sin. I'm sure Ananias and Sapphira, when they were welcomed into heaven with glorified minds and hearts, they were like, hey, thank you for that. That kept me from destroying your glory more. 
But the third reason we see is in verse 11. We must protect our purity against spiritual death because when we do, fear will come upon everyone. Great fear came upon the whole church and upon all those who heard these things. Can you imagine what went through the hearts and minds and souls of the other members of the church when they heard what happened to these two? If anyone else was planning on trying to defraud the Spirit, I bet they gave up on that pretty quick. And those who were hiding unrepentant sin, even if it wasn't the same sin, they were probably like, I should probably repent of this. I don't want to die. I'm sure those who had been taking the Lord's holiness lightly were reminded of its seriousness. As fear came upon the whole church, God was sanctified by those who were near Him. But fear came upon all the church, or not just the church, but all who heard these things. The unbelieving neighbors and family saw how seriously God takes His glory and His holiness. They knew this community was different. It was something new. It was something powerful. They realized that His church must value God's holiness more than their own lives. And fear came upon all who heard. God was glorified among all the people. I think these principles here certainly apply to formal church discipline. If God was willing to strike down those who refused to repent, we must be willing to obey His commands and remove those who refuse to repent. First and foremost, because we desire that God would be sanctified among us. Secondly, we discipline for the good of those disciplined, that they may avoid greater suffering later on. And third, we discipline so that all those who are near and who are far off may hear it and see the glory of God, that He may be glorified by all the people. I pray this day never comes, but if our church does need to practice church discipline in the future, I pray we would do it in faith as we focus on His glory and we trust that God will glorify Himself, number one. Two, He will grow us in greater holiness. And three, He may draw our community to Him even through the act of church discipline because they will see the glory of God and His holiness held up. But this call to discipline does not only apply to the church, it applies anytime we're called to discipline. And certainly we are called to discipline our children, called to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. How does God's holiness relate to this? Well, when it's late and we're tired, and we allow our children to continue in sin because we just don't feel like going through the effort to discipline them biblically. We're saying God's glory is not worth getting off the couch. That's what we're saying. When our child commits the same sin, we've disciplined them four or seven times already that day, and we decide to just, you know what, just let them have their sin. We are saying that their future suffering because of their sin is not worthy of our patience that day. When we allow our child to live an undisciplined life and sleep in, eat whatever they want, run the house, we are proclaiming to the world there is no need to fear God or obey Him because we're not obeying Him and we're not calling our children to obey Him. When we fail to discipline our children, we are not sanctifying the Lord. So kids, look right at me. This is why your parents discipline you, at least when they're doing it right. Not because they don't want you to have fun or because they don't love you or because they, they're mean. Your parents discipline you because they care about God's glory and His holiness. They discipline you because they don't want you to suffer. And when you choose to sin, you're saying that God isn't holy and they want you to know that God is. So next time you do something wrong and they discipline you, pray and ask God to help you see their love and His love. Pray that God would make you thankful for your parents. Pray that God would help you be thankful even for your discipline. And you say, I could never do that. Well, the Holy Spirit's pretty powerful. He can do it. But we must not be deceived and think, well, I don't have kids, so thank goodness that doesn't apply to me. We are all called to discipline. Paul calls us to discipline ourselves. 1 Corinthians 9, 27, we read that in Sunday school this morning. Paul said, I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Friends, when we give in to lust for the third time that week and yet still refuse to get accountability software or give up our devices, we are saying that God's glory is not worth us being inconvenienced or embarrassed. When we give in to gluttony and laziness for the 47th week in a row and refuse to make changes that we know we need to make to be good stewards of God's grace to us, 
we do so we be, because we believe God's holiness is not worth more than one more episode or one more serving of ice cream or one more hour of sleep. When we continue to live in anxiety, hopeless depression, bitterness, broken marriages, or addiction, instead of getting the help we know we need from the church, we are proclaiming to the world that God does not take His glory too seriously. He'll accept excuses and half-efforts. Friends, you'll say, you didn't really talk about the Spirit killing those people. That's true, because I don't expect that to happen today. That was something that happened then. We don't see that happening anywhere in the epistles, but the concept of God's holiness being more important than life is all through the whole Bible. And we must value God's holiness more than anything. Because God loves His holiness more than we can imagine. So much, how do we know how much? He killed His own Son over it. When we see how much God loves His holiness, look at the death of His Son. And we know He loves His children more than we could imagine because He loves His children enough to take their own lives that they may be prevented from more sin and more life contrary to His holiness. And He loves the world more than we could imagine, enough to call us to practice purity in our church and give our all in protecting that purity from attack that we may sanctify Him who are close and that all the people may glorify Him. Friends, I know this is a strange passage, and I know there's a temptation to fear here. By God's grace, we don't need to fear that the Spirit will kill us. Because we have seen the holiness of God. You have heard the resurrection proclaimed from the Word of God with the power of the Word of God. You can choose to, we can all choose to live in holiness today. We don't need to fear Satan or our flesh or death from the Spirit. We can walk in joy and peace knowing that God is holy and that He's called us to holiness. I pray we would all live like that little ermine, that we would value our purity as greater than our own life, that He may be sanctified among us and glorified by all the people. Let's pray. Father, I thank You that You are holy. That You are more holy than we could imagine. We are infinitely unworthy to stand in your presence. Ananias and Sapphira certainly rightly deserved their discipline. But God, we deserve, <coughs> we deserve all the more. So Father, thank you for the grace that covers us. Thank you for the promise of the resurrection that we can hope in. Thank you that there is coming a day when we will now no longer have to fight for purity. We long for that day. We pray for it to come quickly, but as we wait, God, we, we beg you, we pray more than we value our own lives, be sanctified among us who are close and be glorified among all the people that great fear of your holiness may be seen in us. Salvation may come to many and revival to many more as your name, your holy name is proclaimed. It's in that holy name we pray. Amen. Church, would you stand as we sing our closing song?